In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. So we're going to have a look at uh, the sacraments again. This time we're going to look at the Eucharist. Uh, you may recall that a few years ago we had the CCRS course here in Bexhill. Uh, these slides were used for the presentations. Uh, we're just going to convert them into videos so that they can be of use to people, uh, especially when we're not able to gather in person. So this video is on the sacrament of initiation, the Eucharist. So we're, we've already looked at baptism and confirmation. And today we're looking at the Eucharist. Again, a word that we use a lot, but we don't necessarily uh, explain. Not even necessarily uh, a word that we would find in English because it comes from the Greek. The Greek word meaning a thanksgiving, to give thanks. Uh, you might just about get away with translating it as uh, thank you, but that would probably be a little bit loose in, in its meaning. But yeah, we give thanks for things. And we also use the word mass, and sometimes we use mass and Eucharist uh, uh, interchangeably, but they do mean different things. Uh, mass comes from uh, the final words of the celebration, which the deacon or the priest, if there's no deacon, says it's a command, ite missa est, which is loosely translated as go, you are sent. We're commissioned, we're sent out on a mission. We might be more familiar with the phrases go and announce the gospel of the Lord or go in peace, glorifying the Lord uh, by your life. In fact, go and announce the gospel of the Lord, do this by going in peace and glorifying the Lord by your life. But to understand the Eucharist, it might be quite helpful just to take a moment, just to think, what are we thankful for? And uh, firstly, perhaps the gift of life itself. Uh, none of us are necessary beings. None of us can bring ourselves into being. At the very least, we need uh, a mother and a father. And of course, we need God to create and give us our soul. Uh, we give thanks uh, for the gift of home and, and shelter. We're very conscious that there are many people, even in our own communities, that don't have a, a place to live. And we think about that, especially when the weather turns uh, very cold and very, very wet. Uh, we give thanks for food and drink, and uh, it's customary, isn't it, to uh, give thanks for that uh, before and after meals when we say grace. Uh, we also give thanks, of course, for uh, family, and uh, perhaps that saying, uh, blood is thicker than water, might uh, prove relevant uh, as we move forward in looking at these things. And um, we then perhaps might need to start thinking about uh, these natural things that we give thanks for. We might need to think about them uh, supernaturally. So we have life, we have creation, but the new life that we've been given in uh, baptism, a share in the divine life. We might think of home, yes, the shelter that we currently live in, but also that heaven is our true home. In terms of food and drink, yes, of the, the, the nice meals that we, we have, but of course, the divine nourishment that we have in word and in, in sacrament, the body, blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. And yes, we think about our families, but also that the fact we've been incorporated into God's family. We've become children of God and that we have now have many brothers and sisters uh, in the Lord. So let's have a look at the sacrament of the Eucharist. And firstly, let's just have a look at a bit of scripture and perhaps let's start with the Old Testament and just see where we can see signs of the Eucharist already um, coming out for us. Uh, perhaps you might even go to the very first book of the Bible and go and have a read of Genesis uh, chapter 2. And you recall in Genesis chapter 2, um, Abraham is asked to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And uh, when Isaac asks his father where the lamb is for the sacrifice, Abraham replies that God himself will provide uh, the sacrifice. Uh, and Abraham starts to prepare the fire. He binds up uh, Isaac and he is about to, to sacrifice him. But God says, no, he intervenes. And then he does provide uh, Abraham instead with a, with a ram uh, to, uh, to, to offer instead. And we'll see how this uh, is seen very quickly as a prefigurement of how it comes true in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who becomes the Lamb of God. 
And, and that brings us to our, perhaps to our first question. Are we looking here at priesthood or are we looking at the Eucharist? And uh, we'll start to see that, of course, the two are intrinsically linked, uh, that when Jesus institutes the Eucharist, he also institutes the priesthood uh, and the two go hand in hand. And it, it's not possible to have a celebration of the Eucharist, celebration of mass without a priest. Uh, perhaps we might also like to have a look um, at the book of Exodus. It's a book that we often come back to, especially during the season of, of Lent. Uh, and we start to think about the liberation of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Uh, and we look at the Passover uh, and we look at uh, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. We think about the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, etc. And if you recall, there's been Moses has, has been sent to, to liberate the people. There's been a number of plagues to harden the heart of, of, uh, of Pharaoh and to convince him to let the people go. And uh, finally, on the night of the Exodus, the angel of the Lord comes to uh, to deal with Pharaoh and the Egyptians who have been keeping his people uh, captive. And so that um, the angel knows who uh, who to to save and who to not save, uh, they have a Passover. And we look at Exodus uh, 12. Then they ask to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of their door frames of their houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and angels, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And we still sing about this every year at the, the Easter vigil in the Exaltet. And there is a, a little line that the deacon or the priest of no deacon sings, or even a cantor. These then are the feasts of Passover, in which is slain the lamb, the one true lamb, whose blood anoints the doorposts of believers. This is the night when, when, when once you led our forebearers, Israel's children, from slavery in Egypt and made them pass dry shod through the Red Sea. So they've been liberated. They've made their way out in the Exodus and uh, they've crossed the Red Sea and now they left Pharaoh behind. His chariots are swamped by the waters. Remember, we looked at this also in baptism and they are making their way towards the promised land. It's a journey that takes a, a long time, 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, the number 40 is very significant. It means a long time, a very long time, uh, a very significant amount of time. So we see it cropping up time and again, this number 40. We have the 40 days from Christmas to the presentation. We have the 40 days of, of Lent. We have the 40 days from Easter to uh, the, the Ascension. So these are very significant times uh, in the lives of the people of God. But following the Exodus, the people will wander for a long time. Uh, they've left uh, Egypt in a hurry. Uh, they've had that Passover meal, but that's not going to satisfy them um, for very long. Uh, a day, two days at the most. Uh, and as they uh, they wander in the desert, they start to they start to grumble and they moan. Uh, they become increasingly uh, more hungry. Uh, they even wonder whether perhaps they'd be better off back in uh, slavery in Egypt. Yeah. But um, you know, God provides. That's the, the the lesson here. And when we get to chapter sixteen, we hear the Lord said to Moses. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on other days. So God provides them with the manna, the bread from heaven, but he only provides them with enough for that particular uh, day. 
if the Israelites try to uh, hoard, uh, they find that the next day it's all become rotten. So this is a sign to us not to hoard, uh, to trust in the Lord that he will provide for his people. Now, there is an exception to this. Uh, on the sixth day, they're allowed to collect double the amount, because if you recall from Genesis from creation, on the seventh day, God rests. So on our seventh day, the Sabbath, we rest, we recreate ourselves in the image and likeness of God. So the Israelites wander, they wander for 40 years. And during that time, Moses gives them the Ten Commandments, which they place in the Ark of the Covenant. They construct a, a tabernacle, a, a tent of meeting in which the Ark of the Covenant travels with them and where Moses is able to commune with God. And inside this tent, they construct a table where the priest places uh, the bread of presence upon it. Uh, it kind of remains a, a permanent offering uh, to God. So have a quick look at um, the New Testament. And, uh, you know, we, we see right from the, the word go in, in Bethlehem, it's a place that means a uh, house of bread. It's the grain store for Jerusalem. And uh, it is, um, it's a clue already that Jesus being born in the house of bread is something going to be repeating in his his ministry uh, right through until uh, the, la the Last Supper. Uh, perhaps we just think about um, when we look at our Christology, uh, we come to recognise Jesus Christ as being true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, um, as we we'll see when we look at the Creed, where consubstantial uh, basically means that Jesus is the same substance, the same essence, of God the Father. So whatever it is that makes God God also makes uh, Jesus God and he shares in the, the glory and majesty of, of God. Uh, we profess in our creed that Christ for our salvation came down from heaven and by the power of the Holy Spirit became man and was born of the Virgin Mary and who by carrying Jesus in her womb she becomes the Ark of the New Covenant. And uh, we know that Jesus is the word, the word who became flesh and tabernacles himself among us, pitches his tent among us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He, he dwells with us as the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He is the bread that has come down from heaven. Uh, the prologue of John very beautifully starts in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And. Uh, John chapter 6 is going to become uh, very important uh, for us, especially when we get uh, to chapter 6, the bread of life discourse. A central reading if you want to understand uh, the, the Eucharist, especially when it comes to the real presence around uh, Holy Communion. So we think about the history of our salvation. If you come to the if you come to the Easter Vigil, then you really will um, hear the history of our salvation from creation through to the Exodus to the uh, Isaiah speaking to the people in in exile, and um, we see the summary of that in the Eucharistic prayer, the fourth one, which really brings out the history. Uh, of our salvation. Uh, so it's a useful prayer to read and reflect uh, from time to time. It also helps us understand Jesus's priesthood. So remember that our, our story begins with the most wonderful free gift of life, an ultimate sign of love from God. And we understand that we initially walk side by side with God, we enjoyed his friendship. Uh, this friendship included another amazing gift, that of freedom. We give you praise, Father most holy, for you formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care, so that in serving you alone, the creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. But this unnecessary gift of life did not satisfy us. We wanted to obtain more. We wanted equality with God. Perhaps we could might say we wanted to be God without 
God being present. And in doing so, we lose God's friendship. This is our disobedience, our sin. It allows death to enter into our world. However, God never stops loving us and he always offers us his mercy and he promised to send us a saviour. And when through disobedience he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to look forward to salvation. So God makes promises to the Jewish people that he would be their God and they would be his people. And he sends them prophet after prophet uh, to teach them how to love him and how to love each other. But despite this divine teaching, the Jewish people continued to reject God. And so when the moment was right, he sends his only son to them. And Christ humbles himself. He empties himself of his divinity and he becomes man. And you so love the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten Son to be our Saviour, made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He shared our human nature in all things but sin. Just like many of the prophets, though, he was not accepted by the people. Maybe we might say he was not accepted by the religious authorities who convinced the people not to accept him and he was treated like a common criminal but what what was his crime to the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation to prisoners freedom and to the sorrowful of heart joy to accomplish your plan he gave himself up to death and rising from death he destroyed he destroyed death and restored life when, when Jesus made the turn for Jerusalem, he knew he was on a collision course with those uh, Jewish authorities. But he presses on. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while at supper, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. And in a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. We then need to start thinking, therefore, as the Eucharist as a sacrifice. And in the Eucharist, we celebrate how Christ is both a priest and a victim, offers to the Father the greatest sacrifice of love. The resurrection uh, is the Father's acceptance of this sacrifice. And just before Holy Communion, you'll, you'll know that the priest at the altar holds up the host and says, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. But let's just be very clear. What is, what is it we are sacrificing? It's very easy to see, see the, the meal aspect of the Eucharist. You know, the words of institution, take this all of you and eat of it. Take this all of you and drink from it. The altar clearly has a, a, a look of a table. It's table shaped, uh, but it's not like any table we have in our homes. Uh, so it, it, it also looks like a rock, a rock of sacrifice. Um, so what are we sacrificing? And, and in the mass, we offer the same sacrifice that Jesus himself offers on the cross. So we offer in the sacrifice, Jesus, the pure victim, Jesus, the holy victim, Jesus, the spotless victim, Jesus, the holy bread of eternal life, and Jesus, his precious blood contained within the chalice of everlasting salvation. You'll hear those words in Eucharistic prayer number one. Uh, but while this is the same sacrifice of Christ on the cross, it's now a bloodless sacrifice that we're offering 
uh, instead. Uh, and at Christ's instruction, uh, the bread and wine will become his body and blood for us to receive in Holy Communion. We talk about the Mass being an oblation, an offering to the Father. Christ continues to offer the same offering for the forgiveness of our sins, the blood of the new and eternal covenant poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. So in, in the Holy Mass, uh, we, we really are uh, at, uh, at Calvary, we're at the foot of the cross. What's quite difficult sometimes is when you're planning um, masses, especially when you're planning masses with young people, is there's this great temptation uh, to try and give the mass a theme, uh, to try and make it seem relevant to a particular congregation, to try and make it seem more engaging. You may have even heard a person introduce the Eucharist by saying, the theme of today's mass is friendship or family or forgiveness etc etc it's often done with the best of intentions but it is an error there is each and every time we celebrate the holy eucharist uh, the same theme we're always celebrating the passion of christ his resurrection from the dead and his ascension into heaven and at the same time we are looking forward to his second coming in glory the, the eucharist which as we've said right at the beginning meaning thanksgiving is again that source and summit of our Christian life. The Eucharist is the efficacious sign and sublime cause of that communion in the divine life and that unity of the people of God by which the church is kept into being. So at baptism, when we were given the divine life, the Eucharist is the way that uh, we continue uh, to nourish that divine life and, and keep it strong. So we might want to have a look at um, who is offering uh, the sacrifice, who participates in the sacrifice, and, and then move on to thinking about who do we offer the sacrifice to and for. So one of the reasons why we sometimes talk about themes is, is that worthy attempt to engage us in the mass and the, and the um, the church does indeed talk about active participation in the mass uh, uh, sometimes we mistakenly think that we sit there while the priest celebrates mass and uh, yes of course uh, while an ordained priest is essential for the validity of mass uh, he does not routinely celebrate mass on his own uh, it's good if you can to have at least one person uh, of the lay faithful there uh, to represent the community because the sacrifice of the Mass does indeed belong to all the faithful. So pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Obviously, we have the, the, the liturgy of the word. We have the readings and the gospel. Again, it's a, going back to what we were saying in the Old Testament there. We, have, we need to be continue reminded of the history of our salvation and uh, then we prepare the gifts for the sacrifice and then the priest standing as an altar christus another christ to the world um, he stands in the place of christ and explains to us uh, via the preface of the eucharistic prayer why we are offering the the sacrifice to the father uh, for example the preface for holy thursday and the evening mass of the Lord's Supper, the priest sings to us, for he is Christ, the true and eternal priest, who instituted the pattern of an everlasting sacrifice and was first to offer himself as the saving victim. Uh, that's where we get our idea of the word, of the, calling the blessed sacrament, receiving the host, hostia, receiving the sacred victim. And in this uh, Eucharist, we renew his offering as we eat his body. We're made strong. So we drink his blood. We are washed clean. But we do not make this sacrifice on our own. Of course, we join in the whole company of heaven in making uh, this sacrifice. Uh, so even if the priest is celebrating mass on, on his own, he is never alone uh, because he is there 
uh, with the whole company of heaven. And so with the angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So then who are, um, who is the offering and sacrifice to and for? You know, so first and foremost, the holy sacrifice of the mass is offered by Christ uh, to God the Father. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ himself has given us this perfect sacrifice. He has fulfilled all the imperfect sin offerings and animal sacrifices of the Jewish people. And we might take a little bit of time to look at that again when we move on to the sacraments of penance. And he is the holy offering, the unblemished sacrifice. Uh, and so we begin the Eucharistic prayer by immediately acknowledging that Christ came to do the will of the Father. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. That God does not need the sacrifice. It's we who we make the sacrifice because we need it. And so we ask God to accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite and govern her throughout the whole world. We are asking God the Father to accept our sacrifice, this sacrifice that comes from the whole Christian family. And we express our desire to remain faithful with God in this life and the next. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Saint John Paul II, he called the Mass Heaven on Earth. And in this moment, heaven and earth touch. Uh, the Mass is offered in communion with those who have gone before us. Uh, especially the glorious ever Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and Blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, and then you have the list of the other apostles, the first popes and the first martyrs of, of Rome. We ask that through their merits and prayers and all things we may be defended by your protecting help. So there's an exchange, albeit unequal, between heaven and earth. The bread and wine are made holy by the descent of the Holy Spirit, as Eucharistic prayer says, upon them like the dewfall, the Holy Spirit descends, and they become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we acknowledge this exchange, as the priest says, especially in Eucharistic prayer number one. In humble prayer, we ask your almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty. So that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. We, we did mention that the theme of the Mass is not um, friendship or family, but it can be uh, offered for our friends and family. The sacrifice, often you ask the priest to say Mass for the repose of the soul of a loved one or a good estate of a loved one. And uh, we do here in every Mass, uh, remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Uh, we also understand that the sacrifice is, is universal. The word Catholic means universal. And, and what we're doing here in, in our parish of Bexhill, it, it's a participation in the Eucharist that's shared with the rest of the body of Christ. Um, so the Mass you experience in the church in Bexhill is the same Mass, or should be, that you experience in all those uh, rites uh, that are in communion with Rome. So even if um, even if you, you go to a rite that is like a Ukrainian rite or a Syro-Malabar rite, which is going to be slightly different in its uh, 
uh, in its format, it's still the same. It's the same mass. Uh, the same participation is, is possible if, if we're all in communion with Rome. But in, in, in our Latin rite, so when you basically go to Mass in Guildford or if you go to Mass in Brighton or Crawley or London or Paris or Washington, uh, Sydney, Madrid, Rio de Janeiro or Rome, you're going to hear the same Mass celebrated. And you might find that the language is in the country that you're in, uh, French or Spanish, etc. Or dare I even say it, uh, Latin, because you know, that is the official language of the Latin Rite Church. It's still the same Eucharist being celebrated. Uh, Eucharistic prayer number number three. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising to, of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. So at the Passover meal, uh, the Jews ate the Passover lamb and they poured out its blood on the foot of the altar. And so following the institution of the Eucharist, the lamb was no longer to be eaten. Jesus himself was to become the sacrificial lamb of, of the cross. And John the Baptist, uh, right at the beginning of John's gospel, points out Jesus. Behold the lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And if you um, remember Jesus' words, he says, do this in memory of me. Uh, and we understand a Jewish tradition here that we don't simply preserve a memory of Jesus and what he did. Uh, instead, it's an instruction to keep joining ourselves um, as a redeemed community uh, by way of a, a table right to the sacrifice of the cross. Uh, the word rem remember means to make, to, to participate again. Remember, participate again. Uh, Christ died once and for all to save us. There's no other sacrifice, but we do need to constantly draw on this same sacrifice for our life and eternal life. And so there's infinite value in the creature offering a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to the Father. Uh, the Eucharist is a sacrifice because it represents, it makes present the sacrifice of the cross. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are the one single sacrifice. I think I just want to just reiterate that word remember to participate again. When you say to somebody, Will you will you remember me to someone? You're saying, Will you make me present to them? So, so yes, we call to mind, but we actually do so in a very profound way. Uh, so when the Jews remembered the Passover, they felt that they were back in that very moment of the salva salvation, the saving act of God. So when we remember the Eucharist and remember the cross, we believe we are participating again in that same one sacrifice of the cross. So I talked about... Um, a little bit at the beginning about um, John chapter 6 and the bread of life discourse, which is very important for understanding uh, of the Eucharist. So perhaps we might just have a little bit more uh, look at this in detail. So as we know, John, uh, John chapter 6 talks about the bread of life discourse, but first of all, just, just go back to the beginning. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, as we said, the house of bread. He is to be our daily bread. And we see in John's account that just before Jesus performed the miraculous multiplication of the feeding of the 5,000, he gives thanks. So he celebrates uh, a prefigurement of Eucharist. It's so amazing that the people couldn't fail to recognize Jesus as some kind of prophet, at least. And then he, Fearing that the people are about to make him king, Jesus withdraws um, to the hills uh, while his disciples cross to Capernaum. Uh, while they're crossing uh, the lake, a strong wind uh, blows up and Jesus walks across the water and states, It is I, do not be afraid. 
Uh, perhaps more accurately, he shouts at them, I am, which is a strong declaration of his divinity as I am who I am is the name of God. So at uh, Capernaum, the people chase after Jesus, uh, not because they believe in him as their God, but because he has satisfied their most basic everyday need, their literal daily bread. Very truly, I tell you, you are not you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So at the moment, uh, Jesus is uh, seen as a prophet, perhaps as good as Moses, who had given the people bread from heaven. But however, Jesus is offering a bread that is not perishable, like the manna in the desert. And so he must be superior to Moses. And it was not Moses who actually provided the bread, as the bread came from God the Father in heaven. Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus says that he is the bread of God. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But uh, this is quite astounding, uh, and some of the people begin to grumble because they could only recognise him as Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the carpenter Joseph. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus does reiterate that he is uh, the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So John's gospel leaves us in no doubt that the bread that Jesus gives is his own flesh, his own body. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So John chapter 6, well worth uh, taking as a, a spiritual uh, reading. So we need to come on to Holy Communion uh, and uh, I, I hope you see why we haven't jumped straight to Holy Communion because we needed to see a little bit of the Eucharist in Scripture and we needed to understand um, uh, the sacrificial element of the Mass. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at a couple of um, technical terms. You may have heard the phrase transubstantiation. Um, it's a term that's first used formally in uh, 1215 in the wake of the Fourth Lateran Council, in which the church, the same priest, Jesus Christ himself, is the sacrifice whose body and blood in the sacrament of the altar are truly uh, contaminated under the appearances of bread and wine, the bread having been transubstantiated into the body and the wine into the blood by divine power. But that doesn't mean that our theology of the real presence only came to us sort of 1200 years after Christ. Uh, no, because we go right back to um, 103 AD to 165 AD to look at St. Justin Martyr, who tells us, for we receive the Eucharist neither as common bread nor as common drink, but as Jesus Christ our Saviour, through the power contained his own words, from which our flesh and blood are nourished by the conversion, is the flesh and blood of that incarnate Jesus. 
And St. Cyril of uh, Jerusalem said, having been taught these things and imbued with a most certain faith that what seems to be bread is not bread, though sensible to taste, but the body of Christ, and that what seems to be wine is not wine, even though it seems thus to taste, but the blood of Christ. And so we have confidence that when we receive Holy Communion, we are receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not an easy concept uh, for us to grasp. Indeed, many of the people who were following uh, Jesus walked away after that bread of life discourse as recorded in John chapter six. But the uh, 12 apostles remained with him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So in the Eucharist, the bread and wine have uh, changed totally, transubstantiation, into the body and blood of Christ. However, although the substance has totally changed, we still see the form of bread and the form of the wine. That's what we call the accidents, the appearance. But even so, that's very hard to, to grasp. And even, even the early church needs reminding of this. And St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, leaves uh, the Christians there in Corinth in no doubt that what they are receiving is Holy Communion. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the blood in the body of Christ? So just before we receive um, Holy Communion, we, just like the centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant, profess our unworthiness to participate as the body of Christ and to receive him. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Uh, each time we receive Holy Communion, we know that we are receiving Jesus himself. However, we also know that this communion with him is only temporary because we await the summons to join him in heaven, where we may participate in the Supper of the Lamb at the heavenly banquet. So Holy Communion augments our union with Jesus Christ. The principal fruit of an intimate union with Jesus he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Holy Communion preserves, increases and renews the life of grace given at baptism. Holy Communion will separate us from sin and it will cleanse us of venial, minor sin and preserves us from future sin. So it's worth receiving in a state of grace as regularly as possible. Uh, we should just uh, mention that there are um, times when we shouldn't or can't receive um, Holy Communion. So if you're not in Communion, uh, you don't receive Holy Communion because Communion is both horizontal and vertical. So you need to uh, be striving to keep God's commandments and the teachings of the Church. If you're a Protestant, and that includes the Church of England, if, and you were officially reject Rome and you officially reject holy orders as a sacrament and you officially reject transubstantiation, um, except in some very uh, unique circumstances such as danger of death, um, you might, you, you shouldn't normally receive Holy Communion, but you would still need to have an understanding, even in uh, some of these cases where you can receive, that you actually understand the Catholic understanding of the sacrament. Of course, though, there are those who are in Communion who perhaps shouldn't or can't receive Holy Communion uh, because we recognise that we're not always properly uh, prepared or, or disposed. And children uh, prior to the age of reason and those conscious of being in serious sin, uh, they first need to go to sacramental absolution. Uh, of course, there will be one or two people who will find themselves who have committed a grievous act and have incurred either a laetare uh, sententia excommunication by the act of doing it, or they've been had sentence passed on them, uh, which has been imposed by an ecclesiastical authority. You perhaps don't need to dwell too much uh, on that.
And of course, those who persist in manifestly grave sin, you do need to be in a state of grace to receive Holy Communion. So as this is a sacraments mod module, we better look at uh, uh, the form and matter of the Eucharist. Uh, so it's uh, Christ's choice to use bread and wine when instituting the Eucharist. Uh, there's an allusion here to uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, uh, found in the book of Genesis, who offers gifts of bread and wine, and who's mentioned in the letters of the Hebrews, uh, calls Jesus the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In Genesis 14, Abraham has just defeated the king of Chedorlaomer, probably haven't said that right at all, and has rescued his nephew Lot. He meets the king of Salem, that's later to be Jerusalem, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out uh, bread and wine, and now he was a priest of God the Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so the Catechism says that the bread and wine, and the Old Covenant bread and wine were offered in sacrifice among the first fruits of the earth as a sign of grateful acknowledgement to the Creator. But they also received a new significance in the context of the Exodus. The unleavened bread that Israel eats every year at Passover commemorates the haste of the departure that liberated them from Egypt. The remembrance of the manna in the desert will always recall to Israel that it lives by the uh, bread of the word of God. Uh, the daily bread is the fruit of the promised land, the pledge of God's faithfulness to his promises. The cup of blessing at the end of the Jewish Passover meal adds to the festive joy of wine, of which has an eschatological dimension, that being the messianic expectation of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And so when Jesus instituted the Eucharist, he gave a new and definitive meaning to the blessing of the bread and the cup the chalice. So when Christ instituted the Eucharist, he did so under two forms, the form of the bread and the form of the wine. And Christ uh, takes the bread of the Passover and gives it new meaning. Not only will it be his body broken for us on the cross, but it will be food for us. And so the priest takes bread and like Jesus at the Last Supper makes an offertory prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. And by the blood pouring from his side on the cross, he would fulfill the old covenant and make a new and eternal covenant. And so the priest takes the wine and like Jesus at the last supper again makes an offertory prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. So by choosing instead the bread and wine, those non-sacrificial elements of the Passover meal as the emblems, emblems of his atoning death, Jesus detached the new Passover from the sacrificial system and transmitted it, uh, it, transformed it into a fitting memorial of his redemption. This radical transformation can be seen also, for example, in the cup of blessing of the Paschal meal, which becomes the cup of salvation. And again, as St Paul says to the Corinthians, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? By these few words, Paul shows that some of these, uh, some of the elements of the Jewish Passover survive, that, but their meaning has changed. The sacrifice of Jesus is the new reality commemorated by the remaining ancient signs. And the form, so the words, the words of institution at the Last Supper become the words of consecration. Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. And in a similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. And just to finish off the sacramental part, 
uh, we also need to think about a minister and the minister can only be the bishop or a priest. Nobody else can celebrate the Eucharist. If you were going to um, uh, write an essay, if you really, really wanted to, uh, you, you might want to look at some of these questions. Explain to a group of disenchanted teenagers why they should uh, persevere with going to Sunday Mass. Um, explain to a group of First Communion children at the start of their programme what they're about to embark on. The cup of blessing that which we bless is this. Is it not a participation in the blood of Christ, the bread that we break? Is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Discuss. Why should those conscious of mortal sin not present themselves for Holy Communion? Answer with reference to the sacrament of penance. And can the church allow the divorced and remarried to receive Holy Communion? And again, answer with reference to the sacraments of Eucharist, penance and marriage. Um, 